Welcome to the second study in the book of Hebrews with Chuck Missler. The subject of this tape, Hebrews chapters 1 and 2. Praise God. Let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word to our hearts. We would ask you to send your Holy Spirit to be our guide. Give us that visibility of Jesus Christ. Help us to understand those things which you have provided for us, for our redemption and our sanctification. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity just to set all our cares and concerns aside and to spend some time with you. We would ask that you would help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. We thank you that we are all here by divine appointment, that you brought us to this particular moment in time, that we indeed might be with you this hour. We commit all these things before you that we might indeed be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. If nothing else last time, you learned some of the reasons, although they may be wrong, some of the reasons why uh, I have the view that Paul wrote the Epistle of Hebrews. Now, that's not important. It was important for you to know that Paul wrote the Epistle of Hebrews. It would have been signed. Holy Spirit and his wisdom has not had it signed for a number of reasons we reviewed last time. The only reason I mention that is not that it's important, but that if I slip from time to time and ascribe the epistle to Paul, it's because that's my personal frame of reference. It may be wrong. So I don't want you to, on the one hand, uh, uh, take that too far in the sense of saying Missler says he was written by Paul. It may not have been. But I've given you last time all the reasons why. At least I believe that. And if nothing else, at least it will alert you to the fact that there's a bias in the presentation. At least one, and uh, uh, so that might that might be useful. Now, um, as we discussed last time, the writer to the Hebrew believers uh, wrote some time prior to the destruction of this temple. He wrote with the burden of uh, bringing these believers out of Judaism and focusing on that which is, uh, in some sense at least, uh, superseding Judaism. And in so doing, he addresses a number of issues. Now, for the Jewish believer, those are very useful because they bridge from the background that that believer had, that in Judaism, to Christianity. But for those of us that aren't uh, in Judaism or having a background, it's a marvelous way to reflexively get a apprehension of our Jewish roots, in the sense that even as Gentiles, we can begin to p- develop our a more complete perspective by recognizing how Jesus Christ was both a fulfillment and also um, a superseding uh, issue from Judaism. So it's... Uh, to the Jewish believer, it's a bridge from Judaism to Christianity. For those of us that are from a Gentile background, it's a way of looking through that same window the other way to get a feeling for just what is Judaism all about in its prophetic sense, in its sense that it, it uh, prepared the way for our Lord. Um, now, what the writer is going to do is, in the early stages of this book, of this letter, is demonstrate how Jesus Christ is superior to those fundamental ideas that were the underpinnings of Judaism. Last time we focused briefly on how Jesus was better than the prophets. As a Jew, the prophets were a big deal. For Jesus to be higher than, better than, more than the prophets was a big step. The writer is going to take in turn angels. That's going to be our subject tonight. He's going to talk about Moses. Moses is a big deal if you're Jewish. So how is Christ higher or beyond Moses? Don't take those ideas for granted just because we sit here in our smug, you know, New Testament uh, arrogance 
don't, in order to appreciate the solution, you really have to understand the problem. Um, and of course, after Moses, he will take the priesthood, the Aaronic Aaron, and the Aaronic priesthood, and he'll go through a whole uh, concatenation, about seven of the major, naturally, seven of the major tenets of, of Judaism to build a presentation uh, of uh, what Christ really was all about from a Jewish perspective, a fulfillment, a superseding, uh, and so on. Now, the, um, the first three verses we took last time, we spent, the reason we spent a lot of time, of course, we got a lot of background last time. So, uh, But the first three verses of the Epistle of Hebrews are so sweeping, so overwhelming, that it's, uh, even though we're going to really, we're going from verse four on, let's just start with verse one as a warm-up, review what uh, the writer has said to date. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and the upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, comma. Now right away you know it was written by Paul, because who else could go on for four or five verses without even hitting a period, huh? <laughs> Whew. Now, of course, in each one of... We could um, spend a deep study on each phrase because the writer has deliberately concatenated a total summary, to the extent that words can do that, of Jesus Christ. Who he was, his purpose, why he did all these things. I mean, if you really go through, as we did a little bit last time, but that's a pretty sweeping thing. But now we get to verse 4. He, what you may not have caught in the first three verses was the contrast with the prophets and the Son. In the past, in fragments, now and then, God spoke by his prophets. But now, in effect, he's saying he, we've got a complete picture in the person of his Son. So he's already, in the first few verses, started this theme of Christ being better than who? The prophets. Now he's going to introduce a second subject. Verse 4, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath inher uh, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now that closes the sentence, but introduces what's really going to be almost two chapters. The rest of chapter 1 and uh, chapter 2, which deals with the relationship of Jesus Christ and angels. Now, um, why angels? I mean, why? What's the? You know, there's lots of subjects. So why angels? Well, um, it might be useful for us to get kind of a a Jewish view of angels. Um, you and I have a view of angels that's probably a composite of biblical insight, some misconceptions from English literature and German literature. It's such a, you know, and so on, okay? Let me give you an example. Just, you need to understand that you and I both suffer under, uh, uh, under delusions about angels. How many of you believe, how many believe that there's such a thing as fallen angels? How many of you believe there's such a thing as demons? How many of you think they're the same thing? Aha! Uh -huh. Can you find any scripture to that effect? Ooh, isn't that interesting? Yes, the Bible speaks of fallen angels. Yes, the Bible speaks of demons. Are the demons fallen angels? We don't know. It's a presumption. I don't. Now I may be wrong, and I'll, I'll get lots of neat little notes, you know, between now and next minute. But I don't believe you can crisply, clearly link the two. I'm not saying they're not the same. I'm just saying be careful. Because the fallen angels we hear about are reserved in chains and judgment, right? That ain't true 
of some of these demons running around. So, I just I, not that this is a big deal because I don't want to get into these spooky things, but uh, but too much, a little bit. But uh, <laughs> but I do think it's useful for us to recognize that our conceptions are in effect we're uh, we're, we're victims of our literary backgrounds. And so uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it, we always like to be pure and say, well, we're going to stri- deal with it strictly biblically. Well, yes, but you fit what you learn from the Bible in the models that are in your mind. That comes from, so you're always victims of your literature background, dra- dramatic theater, theater background, whatever, and those things. It's, it's, it's important to be, try to be a little cautious. Let's take a look at a little bit of angels um, um, from a Jewish point of view. And I'm going to start in a strange place. Let's start in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is a fabulous commentary on the Old Testament. You'll find that there's all kinds of things in the 7th chapter of Acts that illuminate the Old Testament like the Old Testament. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's from Acts chapter 7 that we know that the Pharaoh of, of the uh, Exodus was not Egyptian. That's from verse 18. In the Greek, the another king is a king of a different kind. And from Isaiah, we know that he was a, an Assyrian, but, and so forth. But anyway, the, ver, the verse I'm really after, now there's a lot of these things. You, when you take, um, you know, the, uh, this whole uh, Stephen's address before the Sanhedrin, it's pretty neat because he really goes, you know, Jew to Jew, uh, uh, summarizes the Old Testament. And there's a lot of in, hints and insights here that helps you understand the Old Testament. But... Um, I'd like to talk about Moses, and when we get to 53, we know that Moses received the law, right? How did Moses receive the law? Well, any student of Cecil B. DeMille knows that there was finger writing on the rings, and that's true, you know, from Scripture. But you notice what 53 says, he, he, who received the law how? By the disposition of angels. Strange phrase. You and I, and it isn't DeMille's fault, but you and I don't think of the law being given by angels. It was God, of course, giving it to Moses. And I'm not saying it's not true, but you know, the role of angels isn't paramount in our mind. It is to the Jewish mind. Uh, let's give you some examples. Turn to Deuteronomy 33. Uh, verse 2. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, and he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with who? Ten thousands of his holy ones. Now, your King James may translate that saints, but that's sort of unfortunate. It actually is the holy ones, and most scholarship implies that that's an Old Testament, the Hebrew is an Old Testament term meaning angels. Ten thousand angels. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Turn to Psalm um, 6817. Now, we're trying to do this the hard way, probably, because in order to figure out the problem the Hebrew writer is dealing with, we have to somehow put ourselves, to the extent that we can, in a, in a, in a Jewish frame of reference. So I'm just trying to give you a flavor of, 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 of how this looks from the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are what? 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them. As when? As in Sinai, in the holy place. Okay? So, see, you and I, as we focus on this Old Testament background and go through Genesis and Exodus and Torah and all this, uh, we may not pick up the sensitivity that the Jewish mind might have towards these things. One last uh, uh, example of this, Galatians chapter 3. Paul writing, again, Paul writing to the Galatians. And bear in mind, uh, 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 you know, Romans, Hebrews, and Galatians are, some, by some scholars, regarded as Paul's trilogy of Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Romans deals with that. How shall they live? Galatians deal with this. How, by faith. And what's the faith epistle? Hebrews. So the three are turn out to be a trilogy, if you will, by Paul on those subjects. But in any case, uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Wherefore then um, serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Interesting. 
Um, now, so uh, we could go on and on about this, but if you were brought up in the Old Testament background, you would have a very high view of angels. Angels are kind of um, special things. Um, the there also is sort of a key angel that shows up all the time. We tend to see that key angel as Jesus Christ. We call that a theophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. It's sometimes called the angel, angel of the covenant in Malachi 3.1, Exodus 3.2. Um, the angel that um, uh, delivered Hagar in Genesis 16, 7. The, angels that, the angel that delivered Lot, while the other two went and took care of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Uh, the Passover night, Numbers 20, 16, describes an angel. Now, incidentally, uh, we're going to get into a little bit of what angels are. Um, sometimes, like in Genesis 18, 19, whatever, they appear like a man. They look like men. In fact, the New Testament tells us that you and I may have entertained angels unawares. There are many people that just have a real thing about being hospitable to strangers because of that verse. Right? So angels are known biblically to take forms that is quite inconspicuous socially. In other words, they look like anybody if they need to be. Um, other places, they take on some pretty wild appearances. Um, countenance like lightning. You know, raiment uh, as white as snow and so forth. You know, you see these dramatic pictures uh, in the Old Testament. Um, you know a couple of things if you've been paying attention to the scriptures. You don't mess around with angels. I mean, two of them destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, one of them, one evening, while they were sleeping, slaughtered, uh, what was it, 85,000 Syrians? 185, excuse me, see, good, okay. Just seeing if you remembered. 185,000 uh, Syrian soldiers at night. Uh, I don't know if they do it like the Turks where they get every other one just to shake up the ones when they wake in the morning. But, uh, but the, uh, uh, and of course Passover is perhaps the most dramatic case where the firstborn, all the firstborn of the cattle and everything else, not, of the Egyptians, were uh, taken uh, in that famous event. Um, and so on. So angels are are um, powerful, powerful creatures. Um, one of the things that we're going to emphasize is is that they are created beings. They aren't eternal in the sense of not having had a beginning. They were made. The scripture highlights many times that they were made, created, fashioned. Um, but they're interesting creatures because they're apparently immortal. They don't, they're, they don't die. They apparently are capable of choices because some of them blew it. And from a hint we get in Revelation 12, we think about a third of them did. Um, they are capable of assuming all kinds of interesting forms. And if you recall that spooky dimension of Genesis 6, um, uh, that's also that's an area of a lot of misunderstanding, uh, and I don't want to get it. We have enough to do tonight without getting into all of that. But if you're interested about how you're really interested in creepy things, uh, then uh, get the tapes on on Genesis chapter six and find out why the flood had to really come on the earth. Um, we know some things about angels. The heaven is their native home, according to Matthew twenty four. They excel in strength, according to Psalm one hundred and three. They are God's ministers. We're going to find that more of that here too, but in Psalm 104, and we'll look at that before the evening's over because it's quoted by the writer in Hebrews for some peculiar reasons. They also minister unto God. They're not only God's ministers in the sense that they discharge some of his desires to have things taken care of, but they also minister to God. They're holy. Uh, that's incidentally Daniel 7, verse 10, if you want to chase some of those. Uh, they're holy according to Matthew 25. Um, they surround God's throne in Revelation 5 and so forth. Um, now, we know that they're ministering spirits from a number of uh, places. In fact, uh, we, 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 we can't look at them all, but I decided to pick a couple. One of the interesting ones is 2 Kings 6. 
2 Kings 6. This is the story of Elisha and his servant. And um, now Elisha's a pretty cool dude, but um, his servant was a little uptight, kind of hyper. And uh, uh, I won't go through the whole story, but obviously, you know, the, the, the Syrians are the enemy, and, and uh, Elisha is, uh, you know, finds out about their war plans and stuff earlier. But we get down to verse 15. It says, And when the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha, was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host uh, compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. In other words, he woke up one morning, looked out there, and they are surrounded with tanks, armor, bazookas, whatever. Or, well, anyway, with horses and chariots. Okay. And a servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? That's polite King James for panic. Okay. Verse 16, and he answered, Elisha answered, Fear not, for they who are with us are more than they who are with them. Now, he's not saying, hey, relax, we're going to win because we've got God on our side. That would be a reasonable answer. I mean, lots of ways Elisha could have said, relax, we're going to win. But he actually said something interesting. He says, they who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. So the, And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Get the picture. They wake up. There's just two of them, maybe a few attendants. And they wake up, and they are surrounded by this very formidable army. Elisha is not concerned. The servant is. So Elisha prays that he might be given the insight. The, pre the presentation the Bible makes in many places, this is one of them, is that there are combatants, angelic combatants, doing battle on your behalf and mine. We don't see them. And there are a couple of occasions in the Scripture where it pleases God to allow us to see that dimensionality, to be aware of their presence. And this is one of them. And when you're aware of them, it's mind-blowing to realize the power that is at, uh, that the Lord has put uh, uh, on our behalf. Now, those of you that are interested in this sort of thing, there's a very readable little uh, book by Billy Graham called Angels, God's Secret Agents. And uh, it's kind of light and easy, not a lot of heavy stuff in there. But it gives a, a number of anecdotes of current day examples where in, 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 in tribal context, missionaries were under great threat. And suddenly they all went away. And years later, when the king of the rival tribe was converted, and the missionary asked him, how come you went away that night? He describes the armies that he saw around the mission, you know, these kinds of things. So they're apparently, uh, according to the testimony at least of some of the missionaries, modern-day examples of the same kind of thing. But let's stay uh, with the Scripture and keep moving here. Um, we could look at some other examples. Um, Daniel chapter 6, Daniel in the lion's den. We'll take the time. You all know the story. Daniel is in the lion's den. Why didn't the lions bother Daniel? Something closed their mouth. What was it? The orthodontists of the angelic hosts, right? Or whatever. The angel uh, stopped their mouths, according to the scripture. In Acts chapter 5 and Acts chapter 12 are two examples where the angels spring the guys out of prison, in the one case, and loose Peter's bonds in the other. You sort of get the impression the special ministry of the angels in the book of Acts was to spring guys out of the can. But it happens at least a couple of places. Um, there's some other ministry hints of the ministry of angels that's a little more, uh, a little different, uh, in Luke 16 where we have uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And when Lazarus died, the angels carry him to Abraham's bosom. So they apparently have you know, something to do with all of that. And uh, we could go on and on. But uh, all I'm really trying to do here is get a feeling for um, this business of the angels. And uh, the idea that Christ 
is superior to the angels is, first of all, one step. And we're going to, we'll discover that the writer picks a number of verses from the Old Testament to support the fact that Christ is superior to the angels. How many verses do you suppose he draws upon? Seven. You read ahead. Good. But then he will go on to anticipate two specific objections. Okay, if Christ is better than the angels, how can that be that he became man because man is lower than the angels? Problem number one. Problem number two, how could he die? Angels don't die. How can Christ be better than the angels but become a man, which is sort of demeaning if you're into angels, okay? And secondly, how could he be subject to death and still be better than the angels? See, unless you really think about the problem, the solutions will sound a little trivial. Now, what makes this kind of fun is, you know, we could say, gee, let's just grant that Christ is better than the angels and get on to chapter 3. Except, um, number one, there's a lot that the Holy Spirit would have us learn about Jesus Christ through this exercise. Secondly, you're going to discover something. You're going to discover that the writer to the Epistle of Hebrews and the readers had a remarkable respect for the Scriptures. Because you're going to discover that not only do the arguments hold water, but they hang on some pretty subtle use of words. And one of the things that I hope you'll come through this experience with is a, is a respect for how they treat the Scripture. Um, some of us here in this room probably are, have, are uh, refugees from what I'll call the, the more liberal Protestant denominations. And it's a, a shock what ministers of Jesus Christ will do, some of them do, to uh, God's Word in terms of bending and twisting and... and uh, Whatever, and it's a it's an interesting contrast to contrast some of the so-called modern day critical scholarship with the way the uh, the experts uh, treat the scripture. So, anyway, uh, back to Hebrews chapter uh, one. We got down to verse four, I believe. Being made so much better than the angels. Now that's something he's asserting at the moment, about to prove as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And here it goes on to prove it. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And uh, and again and again, there's actually going to be a number of these. Now, uh, which uh, under which of the angels have you said any time, thou art my... By the way, this interrogative form, asking a question to make a point, is something that's characteristic of Paul. He does it in 1 Corinthians 9 and Galatians 3, as an aside. It's Paul's style to, to raise a question, a rhetorical question, to make a point. He does it here, of course. But he says... Uh, uh, to which of the angels has he said any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And that leads us then to, uh, let's chase that down. Because part of what we're going to discover, you don't just find, gee, yes, that verse is such and such. This happens to be you know, Psalm 2, verse 7, great. We want to look at that Psalm 2 and see where the guy reaches for that particular verse, the context, and sometimes that's kind of um, exciting. Um, Psalm, psalm 2, and this is kind of a wild psalm. It's probably one of the wildest psalms of the 150 psalms. Uh, you know, we read psalms, and you sort of, most of them are devotional, and you sort of, you can pray them, and you can praise with them, and you can relate to them. <laughs> I don't think you can do that with Psalm 2. I mean, I like I'd love to have you sit down and try to have a devotion with Psalm 2 in this straightforward sense. Because it doesn't make any sense. Unless you know who's talking to whom. And I'll give you a hint, right, so we don't go through it twice. There are three people in the discussion here. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Talking among themselves. Now once you realize that, the whole thing has a different context. Psalm 2, why do, the, why do the nations rage and the peoples imagine a vain thing? <laughs> the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against who? 
against the Lord and against his anointed. Can you visualize them up there watching those guys down there? Vain guys. Against the Lord and against the anointed. Saying, that's what they're saying down there, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his great displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Is that messianic? Yes. How do we know? Well, Paul quotes it in Hebrews. All right, that's... Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now, incidentally, there's two ways he can do that. One way was proposed in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Satan went to Christ and says, Hey, all of this is given unto me, and I can give it to whomsoever I will. It's all yours, if you worship me. And Christ declined. He didn't challenge his ownership. What Satan was offering him was a shortcut. You don't have to go to the cross. Make it a lot simpler. And of course he declined. Here the Father is saying, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. How? By the cross. How? By becoming a kinsman of Adam and redeeming him, being the kinsman redeemer. And we'll get into that a little bit. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And it goes on. Um, now, when did the Father say, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee? When was, now of course it's prophesied here in the rhetoric of Psalm 2, but twice did the Father publicly declare Jesus as a son. Remember when? At his baptism, right on. And when was the other time? Transfiguration, right on. Two times, why two? Witnesses, the number of witnesses, right on. Baptism, transfiguration, this day. Now, incidentally, this day implies that the event occurs in time, that is, within the physical universe, not in eternity beforehand. Therefore, it happened incident to his incarnation. Okay? And you can get into Acts 13, 33, and, 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 and a whole other thing there, but I want to, there's, there, there are some other issues we can get diverged, uh, and, uh, you know, digress off of, but let's keep moving. Um, in that verse, I think we had another place to go. Um, verse, uh, this is back in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, he says, And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, obviously, you have no idea where is he referring that, unless you really do some digging and you discover that this makes reference to the promise that God gave David in 2 Samuel 7 and is celebrated in Psalm 89. But before we get there, let's go to 2 Samuel 7 first so we know what we're talking about here. 2 Samuel 7. Okay, uh, we're really interested in the passage starting from about verse 12 through about verse 17 to focus it a little bit. And um, um, David, of course, would like to build a house for the Lord, but the Lord declines the opportunity because he's a, 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 a man of war. and um, But the Lord is going to, the Lord's going to let Solomon build the house that David wanted so badly. But the Lord's saying, I will build you a house, meaning, it's, meaning the Davidic dynasty. But uh, verse 12, he says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which, will, which shall proceed out of thine own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he can, and so forth. Now, 
there is a sense in which, obviously, this refers to whom? Solomon. Sort of. But you'll notice that the writer to Hebrews and a couple of other places uh, use this sentence, this uh, verse in verse um, 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son, to speak of Jesus Christ. Why does it not refer to Solomon? If you go back, it says, When thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. Oh, Solomon was set up before David was. In other words, there's a, a sense in which the real focus of this verse goes beyond David's lifetime. And, of course, it turns out uh, we discover to be messianic. Now, this is celebrated in Psalm 89. So you might uh, bear with me and pop over to Psalm 89. But uh, it actually, 30 through 33 is what I uh, had uh, earmarked here. But it's, it, the, the whole psalm celebrates this issue. Verse 20, I found David my servant with my whole oil. I have anointed him. And he goes on. And uh, we get down to um, verse 26. And he shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. Now this area of firstborn we're going to get into shortly. Firstborn is actually an position of honor. It isn't primogeniture necessarily. We'll come to that, the word, what it means. But my mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever in his throne as the days of heaven. And um, um, verse 33, nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail, and, and goes on. This whole idea of the Messiah being a son of David is celebrated here in Psalm 89. Um, we're going to get into some of the, there's some issues that this raises, but we're going to get at them shortly anyway. So let's get back to Hebrews chapter 1, and um, we got down to verse 5. Verse 6. And again, meaning that there's another, he's quoting, now he's quoted a couple of places. Now he's going to go, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. What's he talking about? Well, he's actually quoting from Psalm 97, 7. And your Bible may have it a little differently. Uh, in your King James, it says, worship him all ye gods. And that's an unfortunate translation. The Septuagint is more precise. It says, worship him, all ye his angels. And this gets into the linguistic difficulties as to what the, the Hebrew is referring to, whether it's of, of, of the, of the uh, Bar Elohim idea or whether it's uh, of angels. And, and the proper translation would be, worship him, all ye angels, as indicated by the Septuagint. And in fact, the ver it's the version that is being quoted here by the writer to the Hebrews. But here's the point. The angels are commanded to worship him. Let all the angels of God worship him. See, he's putting Christ above the angels. Um, now, this whole business of the first begotten is a complicated issue. We could spend a lot of time. Um, the concept of the firstborn is introduced, uh, well, it comes up several places, but in Genesis 49.3, it refers to Reuben, who, uh, and, and, and the concept of the firstborn involved excellency of dignity, honor, uh, and, and um, uh, position of excellency, which Reuben forfeited because he blew it through his sin, and it was broken down. Part of it, um, the dominion aspect of that, was given to Judah, and his double portion that was entitled to the firstborn was to Joseph, who had the two adopted, who had two sons that were adopted by Jacob as grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But the concept of the firstborn was was uh, forfeited by Reuben and and, and uh, so to speak uh, spun off. In Exodus 4:22, Israel is spoken of as God's firstborn. And what does it really mean? The word firstborn is a word meaning a position of honor. And in, in that verse, it's putting Israel as God's chosen. In that sense, the term firstborn is being used. The word firstborn also means that which surpasses. There's the firstborn of the poor in Isaiah 14. Um, 
meaning the extreme poor. And um, there's also the firstborn of death, meaning the, that which surpasses death in Job chapter 18. The word in, uh, uh, in Jeremiah 31.9, the word firstborn simply means the most beloved. It's used of Ephraim, who was not firstborn. It's a, it's a, we're in a linguistic uh, thing here. Um, now, the word in the Greek, in the New Testament, it appears nine times. Protokokos, if I haven't butchered that too badly. Appears in Matthew one twenty five, Luke two seven, Romans eight twenty nine, Colossians one fifteen and eighteen, and Hebrews eleven twenty eight and twelve uh, twelve twenty three in that form. Of the nine times, eight of them refer to Jesus Christ. It's a title, in effect. It's one of the three hundred titles of Jesus Christ. Um, but the key point, so we don't get off on too many of these tangents. The key point in verse six is the angels are commanded to worship Him. Worship whom? Jesus Christ. So the writer's position is that says, okay, the Messiah, the Mashiach is is above the angels. But he keeps hammering away. You know, he, he's, he's, uh, uh, it's the next one in verse 7. He says, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? And, um, boy, that's um, Psalm 104, if we're going to get into that tonight. And I won't make it if I stop on all of these. Um, his ministers of flame of fire, of course, reminds us of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Also, the uh, uh, the, the threat of over Egypt. Um, anyway, in, in verse seven, he says, "And and of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers of flame of fire, but unto the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God." is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now that reference is from Psalm 45, and it's probably the most mind-blowing reference he has because there's an enormous amount of information in Psalm um, 45. Um, let's turn to Psalm 45. I should have had you keep your finger in the Psalms probably. Okay, because we're, we're going to be in, out of them a lot tonight. And verses 6 and 7 are the verses of interest. This, of course, it's, it's, it's awfully hard to sort of pop in and pop out of, of one of these, uh, of these uh, psalms because there's so much here. But let's just take verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Oh, now, um, thy throne. Now, who is now? This incidentally, we get back to Hebrews chapter one, verse eight. It says, "But unto the Son He saith, Who's He? The Father. What does He say? Thy throne, O God. Now, see if you read that in the Psalms, you miss that. Okay, Thy throne, O God, and you go on. What the writer to Hebrews is pointing out is that that is the Father saying that to the Son. Now, what is he saying? Thy throne, who, O God? Here's a statement of deity. Here's a statement of deity of Jesus Christ. How long is thy throne? It's forever. Now, incidentally, that's not a new idea to you and I. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, that we always see in Christmas, you know, for unto us the Son is born, a child is given, and so forth. And, and uh, 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 it speaks of his eternal reign in verse 7. Daniel 7, where, you see that, where Daniel sees the throne of God, we again see his throne forever. The promise to Mary in Luke 1, his throne would be established how long? Forever. And, of course, in Revelation 22, verse 1, we have the same image. So the throne is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter, so we know that it's a righteous reign. Not only is it a righteous reign, there's two sides to that. He lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Now we might pause for a minute because all we, we're going through all this theoretical stuff. Let's just stop for a second and see if there's something practical here. If you belong to Jesus Christ, do you love righteousness? Sure, that's easy. We can all nod. Yeah, we love righteousness. Do you hate sin? Well, don't be so quick. I mean, that's the right answer, yeah. Sin, sin, if it was ugly 
and hateful and nasty and repulsive, you wouldn't be attracted to it. There's two sides to the Lord's righteousness. To love righteousness and hate sin. One of my prayers is that he will help me hate sin more. Isn't that strange? But think about it. Sin is what he hates. Sin is not what you and I hate, or we wouldn't be in trouble. Okay? So, well, I don't want to beat it to death. Uh, fine. Look at John 14, when he promises to send the Comforter, one of the things the Comforter is going to do is help you with that issue. John 14, 21. And uh, in, one of the letter, in the letters to the seven churches, this issue comes up, and I've got to, I'm going to get myself trapped here if I go into all these um, side issues. Incidentally, just as an aside, we've got this, this, uh, this uh, oh wait, I didn't finish. Okay, therefore God thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, that's an interesting question. Is that the, the theologians, will, their libraries are full of books. So who are the fellows? And I think I'm going to just duck that because that's a long thing. But there are at least, you'd expect seven things, but if it's messianic, you'd expect eight, right? Seven is complete, but what is eight? The new beginning? The number of Jesus Christ, right? There are eight issues here. These two verses. It announces his deity. It presents his position, his throne, his kingship, the reference to the scepter, the excellency or the impartiality of his, of his reign, the perfection of his character on earth, the place of his subjection, his reward in terms of being anointed, and his preeminence being anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows. All that is tucked away in this little verse in, in Psalms. Um, but in the interest of keeping moving, let's get back to Hebrews. I think we got all the way down to uh, uh, verse 8 and 9 here. But unto the Son he saith, thy, the, argue, the Hebrews writer is arguing, but unto the Son, the Son of God, he saith, thy throne, O God. He said, you know, I wonder what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with this. They, they, they must assume that Paul was really mixed up, or whoever wrote Hebrews, right? Um, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Obviously a quote from that. Okay, now, uh, he's not through. He keeps moving here. Um, hmm. And... Now, that and is not obvious. What he's doing, he's concatenating references. Okay, so we're going to another one. He says, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall become old as doth a garment. As a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So, uh, that's a quote. It happens to be quote from Psalm 102. Now, uh, what we really should do, but I think I'll not make it if I do, we really should read Psalm 102 because um, the first 11 verses... Relax, we don't have time for all of it. But, uh, Psalm 102, first 11 verses deal with the affliction, the travail of his soul. And then from... Um, see, there's a lot here. Uh, a lot of it links to Revelation 2. Um, and we're really heading uh, uh, for, for um, verses, you know, 23, 24, 25, 20, 25 through 27. But you can't go into Psalm 102 without marking if you haven't already verse 16. If your Bible doesn't have uh, 102.16 marked, you might do that. It's got nothing to do with the subject. and It's got everything to do with the subject. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Is that prophecy? Is the Lord building up Zion? If you don't know the answer to that question, blow your budget and go to Israel and take a look around. 
Look around. Uh, in our, now I don't mean today, tomorrow, next month, maybe, but certainly uh, in the span of our lifetime. It's uh, some exciting things going on in a biblical context, because when the Lord shall build up Zion, it says, He shall appear in His glory. So I have that marked, and in the margin it says, Hallelujah. Okay? But getting down here, um, verse 22, And when the people are gathered together in the kingdoms to serve the Lord, He weakened my strength in the way, and He shortened my days. And I said, O oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days, for the years are throughout all generations of old Thou laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall become old like a garment. Like a vesture, thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and, by, and, and thy years shall have no end. And the children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. Now, oh boy, from here we go to we could go to Proverbs 8 and some other places, but... Uh, um, Foundations of the earth. We could spend an evening on the foundations of the earth. Uh, the foundations of the earth apparently are pretty important. It doesn't just appear here in a psalm. It's quoted. It appears 25 times in the scripture. Foundation of the earth. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, the old Ptolemaic cosmology had the earth, the center of the universe. Sun rose and went around the earth. And that was the old Ptolemy, Ptolemy what's sometimes called the Ptolemaic uh, cosmology. And then the guy by the name of Copernicus came by and said, oh guys, wait a minute, that's silly. Got these planets and things, and he figured out appropriately that the planets, the Earth being one of them, revolve around the Sun. Rotate around their axis and revolve around the Sun. And we have the so-called Copernican theory. And uh, that's good stuff. And uh, so we, the, you know, the Western world embraces that for a while. Of course, uh, um, and, of course, all this time, you know, everybody's chuckling at Psalm 19 where it says, speaking of the sun, that his circuit is from one end of heaven to the other and his circuit is orbit to the ends of it and all this. Well, uh, uh, meanwhile, a guy by the name of Einstein comes along and says, uh, whoa, guys, it's all relative. Everything, motion, mass, time, all this is relative to one another, whole theory of relativity. Um, everything's relative. And because everything's relative, you can take any reference point you like. Now, oh, by the way, we have a thing called a galaxy and a universe, and while we're going around the sun, we're spinning around our own axis, but then we're revolving around the sun, the sun is spiraling off to the constellation Vega, and, and this whole thing is like some, I think they've got something like 18 different motions in, in, that you can actually lay out if you're disposed to do. If you really want to build a vector of your, your position through the universe, you can account for at least 18 components of it, counting your tangential speed on the Earth because it's rotating on its axis, and the Earth's going around, the, you know, and on it goes. And of course, all of this, as we get aware of the universe, it gets bigger and bigger, and the more puny the Earth seems, and so forth. Except, if you really are sophisticated, in the Einstein sense, you know that all things are relative. And you can put the reference, then, anywhere you like. So if I choose to make my reference the Earth, I'm not wrong. I, it's relative, right? So I can, I'm just as justified doing a, ge doing a geocentric universe as anybody. Um, I'm one of these screwballs that happens to believe that the Earth is the center of the universe. Now, you can't disprove me because of Einstein, fortunately, so I can hide behind him <laughs> to be free of assault. What's my point? Because Jesus Christ said that, uh, you know, that he went to the belly of the Earth, right? The bottomless pit has to be where there's no bottom. The only place there can be no bottom is at the center. Huh? Think about that. And uh, furthermore, where's Gehenna? In the center of the earth? No. Hades and Sheol is in the center of the earth. Where is Gehenna? In the outer darkness. So I happen to be one of these guys that have, has regressed all the way back to maybe before Ptolemy. But anyway, it shows you there's no hope for some people, me being one of them. Um, don't lose your place here because we're going to come back to Psalm 104 and Psalm 110, but let's hold your finger around this neighborhood and let's go back to... Um, Okay, we got down to verse 12, right? And we could talk a lot about the universe changing and all this, as the vestures thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed, And but thou art the same, and we could go into that. Um, we know the universe is totally changing. Uh, there's the entropy laws and second law of thermodynamics and, and all that stuff, but it's really off the subject. Let's keep moving. Verse 13. But Paul has one more shot at you before he closes the chapter. But to which of the angels said he at any time... 
sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, you have a tough time going through the Old Testament trying to find where God says that to one of his angels. And to a Jewish mind, see, against the rhetorical question, that obviously he never said that to the angels. But he did say that to the Mashiach, where in Psalm 110, Psalm 110, which incidentally, I love to throw out some nice irrelevant things that are probably useless. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. That makes you pay attention to Psalm 110, because it's quoted more than any other psalm in the in the uh, New Testament. We'll be back here because Psalm there's a there's a quaint little phrase back in Genesis about a character named Melchizedek, which if that were left alone, you'd ignore him because he'd be lost in the names of all those other things happening in Genesis. Except Psalm 110 in verse four brings him up, and then of course the writer to Hebrews is going to make a big thing of that later. So we won't get into that tonight. But the first verse is interesting. Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make my, thine enemies thy footstool. Isn't that interesting? Now, the writer to Hebrews is saying, Okay, that promise is what the Father gave the Son, right? Sit thou at my right hand, right? Um, interesting. Until I make thine enemies a footstool. And what, what the writer to Hebrews is saying in verse 13, verse chapter 1, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit at my right hand till I make the enemies, the, uh, thine enemies thy footstool? And then he shifts um, and focuses on what the angels are. He's, he's gone through now seven um, scriptures, or anyway, a number of them. I uh, forget whether it's seven at this point or not. Anyway, a number of them one after the other, proving that Christ is above the angels. But then he comes right at it. What are the angels after all? Verse 14, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister who? To whom? For them who shall be heirs of salvation. Who? Who are the heirs of salvation? Everybody? No, the believers, those that are Christ's, the heirs of salvation. You are, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are appointed in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, to be an heir of salvation. And uh, we'll talk, we, we, could, we could really have some fun with that one, but we won't get through chapter 2. I have this wild ambition that we're going to make it all the way through chapter 2 also. So. Um. So the writer so far, you could argue at this point, has done a very comprehensive job at um, s establishing that Christ is above the angels. Uh, because um, he's obtained a better name, better position. Uh, they're commanded to worship him, and you can go through your own outline there. So the next four verses are sort of a parenthesis. Okay, guys, if, you, if that's true, what does that mean for you and me? Here's where the commercial comes in. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, that's a heavy word. In the book of Hebrews, the word therefore is, um, you know, an introduction to heavy-duty stuff. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, the writer here is not only a profound theoretician, no, he commanded the scriptures and has assembled the basic foundation to his argument that Christ is above the angels, but then he's, he's the ultimate pragmatist too, because he slips it right to you. Okay, if that's true, then we better pay attention. I think, I think, the, uh, I think the, the little... Uh, you know, glib thing is is uh, we have to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And I guess that works. Uh, I'd somehow like to find a way that uh, rattles when you shake it. Somehow it bites more. I'd like to find a way that we could really grab it. Well, let's let's get, let's let's get through the four verses. Um, Lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, 
And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. In other words, um, uh, this word neglect, by the way, means made light of or failure to give earnest heed to or to remain inattentive. He's saying, as dramatically as can be expressed, pay attention, you've got a responsibility in all of this. Now, by the way, uh, in at this point through the letter, if we have outlined this carefully, the writer will have made um, seven points about the significance of the Son of God. That he has a more excellent name, verses 4 and 5. Uh, that he's uh, worshipped by the angels, verse 6, that he, in fact, made the angels, in verse 7, that he is the one sitting on the throne, they're not, that he is anointed above them, that he himself was the, crea- the immutable and eternal creator of the universe, and that he has the higher place of honor. Those seven points have been made till now, if we have been you know, rigorous in our outline. Something else that's interesting is... In verses 2 and 3, we had these different phrases concatenated about the Son. Uh, the fact that He is the Son, that He's the heir, uh, that He made the world, that, that He's the brightness of His glory, the express image, that He purged our sins, that He's the heir of salvation, and He sat down at the right hand. Those are all issues that were hinted at early that have been established now at this point with Old Testament references, um, which is practicing what he preached, because Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, that we should prove all things. And so those eloquent summaries he put in the verses 2 and 3, he subsequently has nailed down with Old Testament Scripture. If you really want to tie that all together. Um, now, this whole business of verses, the first four verses of chapter 2 is an admonition to get with it, not just to listen get into a head trip, say, gee, isn't that neat? Theoretically, isn't it profound that Jesus is the creator of the universe? He's saying, that. Uh, let's get down, and what does that imply for you and I? How do we, when we leave this room, change our viewpoints, our attitudes, our actions by those facts? Um, that's what Paul is sort of raising. He's going to deal with this heavily later in the epistle, but he's already warning us that there's you know, a series of commercials uh, uh, coming through here. Uh, Paul had this mentality that we're in a race. 1 Corinthians 9.24, Philippians 3.13 and 14, 2 Timothy 4.7 and Hebrews 12.1. All are, he all speaks of life as a race. He had an intense sense of urgency. And he tried to infuse that in his letters. Corinthians, Philippians, Timothy, and Hebrews. Um, And what that implies, yes, a sense of urgency with respect to time, a competitiveness, if you will, against the powers against us. It implied self-discipline, personal exertion, and perseverance. And if we had the time, I'd like to hammer that more because you and I tend to be brought up in the the message of grace. By grace we are saved, not works. And and, uh, may the Lord grant that I don't put anyone on a works trip. I don't intend that on the one hand. We are, in fact, saved by His grace, and, and we are empowered by His Spirit if we indeed are, are uh, His children and so forth, on the one hand. On the other hand, that sometimes causes us to sort of coast. And it's clear from Paul's style that he would not have a sort of coast. He would have us rest, and we'll talk about that before the book of Hebrews is over. But he would have us move out. Paul wore out shoe leather. You don't do that in a library with books and quoting from the Old Testament. You do that by your walk. Okay. Well, uh, there's more to be done here. Uh, there's two objections now that faces Paul as he goes. He's now demonstrated that Christ is higher than the angels. There's two things which, if you haven't thought about it, will bother you. If Christ is above the angels, how can that be if he became a man? Because man is lower, a lower level than the angels. Angels are much more powerful. They're, they excel in strength. I think it's the Old Testament phrase, and the rabbis made a big thing of that. So angels were way up there. 
And if Christ is above the angels, and then came down to be a man, that's a problem. Because then he's no longer better than the angels. He's, he's become one of them. Man. Part problem one. Problem two is he died. Christ died. How can that make him better than the angels? Because the angels are immortal. So, so to a, to the, to the Jewish mind, that's a problem. How do I deal with that one? Okay. Um, now what he's going to do is demonstrate that his humiliation and suffering is the cause for his exaltation and glory. That his inheritance came about because of his willingness to lower himself, become a man, and subject himself voluntarily even unto death on man's behalf. And in that is his glory that goes beyond all things. That's the point that he's going to weave here in, in, the, in the remainder of chapter 2. Um, and that, of course, will take us into Psalm 8, along with the book of Philippians and so on. So let's, let's keep moving here. Uh, I think we uh, managed to, to verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, of which we speak. Um, this world to come is not the cosmos, like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's the cosmos, different work in the Greek. It's not the aeon, the, the, the age, that's another word commonly used, but it's the oikumeni, which is the habitable place, the ha- habitable place. P- occurs 15 times in the New Testament, 13 times refers to the earth. To make a long story short, it refers to the millennium, not the after, you know, not, not, not later. It's the, it's the earth, but the, you know, the, the millennial kingdom. And Matthew 19 is a reference there, but I don't think we'll have time to get into all that. But the angels hath he not put in subjection the world. In other words, the, the, the angels never had authority over the world. They ran errands for the Lord. They ministered to the spirits, they ministered to him, but they never had authority in that sense. Okay. Verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all, sub, uh, all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. <laughs> um. Okay, this gets into the... Okay, where, where, now, first of all, where are we, where are we uh, trafficking here? We're trafficking in Psalm 8. Back to Psalms. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, The work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now, incidentally, you wonder, well, what is that? Sort of the typical Hebrew echo, man or the son of man. It's pointing out that it's not talking about Adam, because Adam's not son of man. It's going to ultimately refer to the last Adam. First Adam was the son of whom? God, according to Luke, right? The genealogy. Adam was not a son of man. So this isn't the first Adam. It's the second Adam, the last Adam we're talking about. Son of man, that thou mindest him. For thou hast made him a little. Now that word a little has two meanings, both in degree and time. For a little while is the proper translation. For a little while. Lower than the angels. How? By becoming man. And hast crowned him with glory and honor. That's the contrast, okay? Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. By the way, that includes the angels. Thou hast put all things under his feet. That is ultimately. Because we're going to, the commentators, the, the writers can point out, we don't see that yet. Okay? All the sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, uh, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Psalm 8. Now, when we get back to the way that he, the, the writer to Hebrews is using that, 
back in verse you know, uh, 6, 7, and 8, What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little, that is for a little while, lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. And of course, the implied reference here is that angels are also works of his hands. Thou putst all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all, all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. In other words, everything. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. For what purpose? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise to thee. Um, yeah, we may make it. Um, one of the points that emerges here is that the, the last Adam, is that, is that a comfortable phrase, the last Adam? Are you familiar with that as a title of Jesus Christ? Paul uses it in his other letters. The last Adam gained more than the first Adam lost. Adam, through sin, forfeited his dominion, right? Did he ever have dominion over the angels? No. The last Adam gained dominion over what? Everything. Everything. And by the way, the earth isn't the only thing. That's true. By the way, you and I aren't the only thing saved. The earth, the creation, there's a lot going on here. But one of the points I'll make before the evening's over, but I'll make it now so I don't forget with the time running out, is there's one group that are not saved. The fallen angels. One of the great mysteries is that God reached beyond the angelic realm to us and chose in His grace to save us, to provide this incredible uh, sequence of commitments and arrangements that you and I might be redeemed. It's provocative to recognize He didn't do that for the angels that fell. We find from Jude and James and Peter and these places that deal with those passages, you can look them up on your own. So, is they are reserved for judgment. Isn't that interesting? Only the redeemed, I mean, only, only you and I, the believers, when we study the book of Revelation, we find that the redeemed, you know, can, can, can sing that particular song that, uh, uh, that uh, speaks of, of our redemption. Um, The difficulty here is there's so many, there's so much here that, uh, that, uh, oh, but we see Jesus. How do we see Jesus? Like Abraham said in John chapter 8, Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, you know, through the eye of faith, in effect. Um, and there's another big issue. Did Jesus Christ die for everyone? Or just the ones that he believed, that believed in him? Well, <laughs> that's complicated. Because um, I think I'm going to skip that one. <laughs> we know that he died for his people. For my people was he stricken in Isaiah 53, 8. And, um, gee, shall we stir this one up? Um yeah, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, Isaiah 53, which, of course, I, I, you probably have memorized, but Isaiah 53 tells you who he died for. Um, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? Verse 8, and he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. That Lord's people. Was he stricken? If I turn to John 10, 10. 
John 10:10. 10, 10. John's talking. About, uh, he's talking. The Lord's talking about who He's saving, and the thief cometh. Uh, verse 10, not to uh, steal, but to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it abundantly. Do you mean everybody? Well, let's skip down to verse 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Um, and you also, uh, you know, you, uh, just to give you a flavor of where I'm headed, uh, turn to John 17, the, the Lord, uh, what what's, could be properly called the, the Lord's Prayer. This incredible chapter where he he prays uh, for his own. Uh, verse 8, he's speaking to the Father. He says, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and they have known surely that I came out of thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 9 is an interesting verse. I pray for them, the who, his own. But he says an interesting thing. I pray not for the world, but for them whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Um, and we could go on, and, and I'm not sure there's a lot of fruit in this, but, but uh, if, you, if you study the, the prayer between the Lord, the Lord and uh, Jesus Christ and the Father in John 17, uh, you get a very, very intimate, on the one hand, you get a very, very intimate feeling between his, the, his own and him, that they are one. He says, as Jesus says to his Father, even as you and I are one. And yet you also get the feeling that's an elect, small group, separate from uh, the rest. Um, Oh, boy. Um, we get down, I think we got down here through, what, verse 10, 11, 12, uh, uh, saying, I will de- verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, Ecclesia, will I sing praise unto thee. And uh, that's, surprisingly enough, out of um, Psalm 22. All know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm sure that Psalm Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are, are two chapters you really should try to make your own, commit to memory. Isaiah 53 is the Old Testament, is the Holy of Holies, if you will, as some people call it, of the uh, book of Isaiah, where it uh, re-describes uh, the, the purpose of our Lord's death. Psalm 22, obviously, is written as if it was the Lord's own words, is what he felt and saw and experienced as he hung on the cross. Dramatic psalm. Uh, the first 21 verses of it are in his loneliness. His loneliness. But from verse 22 on, he is accompanied, the language accompanies those that are the heirs of, the, the, the beneficiaries of the salvation that's thus, thus uh, brought about. And... Um, um, yeah, maybe we should look at that. I should uh, not shorten the time that much. Psalm 22 is one you should really embrace. First 21 verses are his. His. his he's. He's forsaken. He's. He's. It opens up, of course, to that famous quote: "My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken me?" You get down to verse 7 and 8. It says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot up the lips saying, and they shake that saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing if he lied him. It's interesting that one of the attributes that was perceived by his enemies was that he always trusted the Lord. In that indictment of his enemies. Isn't that an interesting revelation? Wouldn't you like those that make fun of you make fun of you because you're always trusting the Lord? Boy, isn't that a backhanded blessing? Huh? And, of course, they're making fun of him and, 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 as, as he's up there. Um, and we're going to see how he did indeed trod the path of faith himself in the next, uh, in the next quote in, in Isaiah. When we get, we'll get, we're, I mean, in uh, Hebrews, when we get to Isaiah chapter 8. But before we get there, of course, he, in verse 14, he gets out of joint, and we have the Gentiles uh, around him in verse 16, and they pierce his hands and his feet, which, of course, is remarkable because... That was invented uh, hundreds of years after these psalms were written. It was invented by the Romans in 98 uh, B.C. And uh, 
of course, the capital, the form of capital punishment in Israel at the time. The Psalms written with stoning, so this pierced my hands and my feet is kind of a provocative thing. I may count all my bones, they look and stare at me. They part my garments among them, cast lot, you, lots upon my vesture. All these things are surprisingly crisp details of what occurred at the crucifixion day. First 21 verses uh, by himself. Then verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Now the word brethren turns out to put him on resurrection ground. Prior to the resurrection, there was disciples. There were lots of different labels. Brethren after the resurrection. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the, here it's translated congregation because it's the Hebrew. In the Greek, the word where it's quoted in Hebrews is ecclesia, the church, the assembly, the, the believers. I will, will I praise thee. And on he goes. Um, getting back to Hebrews now, we, fin- we got down to verse 12. Verse 13, Hebrews, the Hebrews writer quotes again, he says, And again, I will put my trust in him. Now he happens to be quoting from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17. I won't take the time to keep moving on. But it's important to know that Jesus trusted the Father. That's why he didn't turn the stones into bread when Satan tempted him. Could he? Could he snap his fingers and had a wholesale bakery? But if he did, he'd be asserting his authority for his own behalf. He wasn't trusting the Father, you see. That walk of faith was what it was all about. And Hebrew and Isaiah 8.17 predicted it, and here he makes the, the point here that um, this is why he had to become a man. Why did he have to become a man? To be your and my kinsman and walk the walk that we needed to walk and couldn't. The walk of faith. That means that he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. That means when he did the miracles, he did them by his authority? No, by the authority of the Holy Spirit. Why? So he puts himself in our shoes, if you will. Position himself as a kinsman redeemer. The goel, as the Hebrew would put it. In verse 13, again, Behold, I and the children whom God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is the devil. Oh boy. Um, we can uh, get into a whole thing here. Did physical death really still is in God's hands? Deuteronomy 32, 39, 1 Samuel 2, 6, Psalm 68, 20, point that out. But the wages of sin is death, and it's the, it's the fear of death, the bondage of death that Satan uses and, and is the mechanism that he's referring to here. So he had, in effect, the power of death uh, 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 was in the hands of... of uh, and he said that he, that he might destroy him that hath the power of death. Now, he doesn't mean destroy in the sense of annihilate. He means nullify, put to naught, equalize, uh, uh, make it render ineffective, if you will. That is the devil. Verse 15. And deliver them who, through the fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What bondage? The bondage of sin. The wages of sin is death. And that, it's in that sense that the writer is talking to, ta- dealing with here. And deliver them who, through the fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Are you subject to bondage? Do you have a fear of death? Is death have, well, see, that's... See, that's the point. Because you're freed from the wages of sin. How? Because he took care of that. He paid it. He was made sin for you and I, we know from the scripture. Verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now, is he talking about the physical seed of Abraham? No. No. He's talking about the spiritual seed by faith. He's using that. Uh, Wherefore, in all things, verse 17, it behooved him to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to help them that are tempted. Um, boy, uh, I think we made it. Uh, we we sort of s- slipped through a minefield here 
of a lot of issues. Um, some of that was just uh, terror and cowardice on my part. Some of that was the Holy Spirit moving the clock so that you won't be exposed to the misconceptions that I might lead you into. Um, and, it's, and, and, it, and it's pretty easy to, um, in, in, a, in a letter like Hebrews, to really spend an awful lot of time on all the theological issues or doctrinal issues that come up and as such maybe lose the thrust of it. Um, but... Uh, um, when we net it out, I think... Uh, it's clear that we have, we're dealing here with the most profound truths about Jesus Christ that the Scripture deals with. His role, His mission, His achievements on your, your behalf and mine. Since the, 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 the narrow function of this area of the Scripture is to show, to make Him distinct from the angels, the key point was He did not become an angel to save angels. That's wild when you think about it. I have no idea what kind of investment God has in angels. But the ones that fell are reserved to judgment, according to the Scripture. But the investment that God has made in man, he has decided to spend the most precious that he has, his own son, incarnate him as a man to make him an, a kinsman. and endure the suffering and death for all the sins that you and I have done. Now, we can get into this whole thing, was it just us? Did he die for those that aren't saved? Which is really an academic issue I don't want to spend a lot of time on. And a lot of different views, obviously. But the main point is, is that God went that far for you and I. Why did he do it? Why bother? Don't ask that question too much. You know, I think, I think it was Wilbur Smith that said he praises God that he was chosen when? Before the foundation of the world. And the reason he's so good about this is if he looked at me now, he might have changed his mind. <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord has gone to incredible lengths to give you and I life. And part of what the writer is going to deal with, he did in the first four verses of chapter 2, and he's going to do it again, so you'll get another crack at you. Uh, but all of these things are not just academic exercises. Some of them are perhaps little side trips, but the sweep, the majesty, the power, the reality of what's before us demands of you and I a response. It means that it should affect everything. It means that we should love what we should love, righteousness, His holiness, his word, the majesty of his treasures he's put there for you and I. It's part of it. It also describes what you and I should hate, deplore. There are things that we should be angry over. There are things that probably, if I can use the expression, should cause us to lose our temper. Now, my wife will be quickly able to point out to you that I haven't gotten those sorted out quite right yet. Okay? But there is a thing called righteous indignation. There are things that when you read in the paper or you hear it's happening in the neighborhood or, or encounter at school that should put you in a rage on behalf of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because being His implies that you love righteousness and you hate iniquity. So if, you, if the Holy Spirit is getting those things sorted out right in your life, praise His name. Uh, Yes, these things demand a response of you and I. They should be increasing our appetite for these distinctions. What is an angel? Where does the Lord fit? Why did he do this? Why did he have to come down here? And so on. You know. And of course, obviously, the, the book of Hebrews doesn't end with chapter 2. We're going to have ample opportunity to uh, focus on some of these things. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we praise you that you have given us this incredible inheritance that you have allowed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to come down so far and endure so much that we might live. We thank you indeed that for a little while he became lower than the angels and endured suffering and death. 
that we might be healed, saved, and presented for fellowship with you. We ask you, Father, in response to this, that you would indeed increase in us an appetite for these things, that you would just move with us in our very being this coming week, that you would help us to focus on those things that you'd have us focus on, that you would ha- that we would love those things that you'd have us love, that we would hate those things that you would have us hate, that we would indeed be increasingly conformed to the mind of Christ. That in all these things, we indeed might be more pleasing, more responsive to you. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen.